We have talked about making another Franken brew or a Franken mead, however you want to call it, and we went looking for some things to work with and we decided on IBC root beer. Initially, we were actually looking for Mountain Dew, but we wanted the Mountain Dew. There was a, a couple of years ago, there was like this big thing where everybody was doing the retro style beverages. The raw cane sugar. Where they used raw cane sugar. And that's what we were looking for. But apparently that fad has passed and now everything's no sugar, yeah. which isn't, isn't going to work. Because now it's non fermentable fake yeah. sugars. We don't want that either. But we, we did find this one, right. which is root beer. Which and is probably our favorite root beer, too. Yeah. So, you know, if we ever have root beer, it's usually IBC. But what, what she was getting at is the Mountain Dew, I'm sure it's still around somewhere, but we couldn't find any. Um, so we went with the next best thing. And let me just read to you the ingredients that are in here. Carbonated water, cane sugar, caramel color, sodium benzoate. That could potentially be an issue. Uh, natural and artificial flavors, modified cornstarch. Not sure why there's cornstarch in root beer, but there is. Citric acid, probably not an issue. We're gonna check. We're gonna check the pH on this too. Um, Quillia extract. I'm probably saying that wrong. And it is produced by yeah. This is actually made by Dr Pepper and Seven Up. I I did not know that until until reading this earlier today. So there's not a lot in here that I wouldn't want to try to ferment, except like the whole natural flavors thing. We all know that's like stuff from a beaver's butt or something, you know, it's just the way it is. Sure, the, the sodium benzonite or whatever, Benzoate. But thank you, is a preservative. And that's why it could possibly be a problem because preservatives are by their nature- What prevents what fermentation. What prevents fermentation. <laughs> yeah. Now we are going to take measurements and do all the things but I just wanted to get that out of the way that that's why we chose this one and that's why we're going with this one. We may try others in the future, but for today, we're going with IBC. So what's the first thing we gotta do? The first thing we have to do is actually a little odd. We need to make this go flat. Yep, because it's carbonated now. We don't want the CO2 in there because the CO2 could actually inhibit the yeast fermenting this. Because if you think about it, the byproducts of yeast creating alcohol is that they create alcohol, but they also create carbon dioxide. And so if they're swimming around in what they deem their wastes, they just might not do their thing. Exactly. So let's grab a pitcher and get pouring. All right, we are looking to make a full gallon of this brew. We're not even sure if it's gonna be a mead or a wine yet. We're playing that by ear. You'll understand why in a minute. But we got out our pitcher that has these raised numbers on it. By the way, we love this pitcher. We make a big deal about it. But if you wanted to get your own, there's links to it in the description below. It is an Amazon thing. We do get a couple pennies if you buy one, but it doesn't cost you any extra to do so. And that's the end of that ad. So. The reason why I want to use this one is because that way I can know when I hit a gallon of this brew. And the reason why I'm not just pouring it right into a fermenter is because I want to degas. There's another thing that we want to happen along the way, and that is adding oxygen to the brew. So these are at room temperature, and there's a good reason for that. If it's warm, the gases will come out much easier. If it's cold, they'll stay in and make it a lot harder, but it's going to foam up a lot, especially when I pour it like this, because we want to aerate this. So we want to take out the CO2 and add in oxygen. This may take a while. Nope, not going to throw the bottle. Now, before anybody starts to sell us that this is ridiculous or anything like that, you're, you're right. right. <laughs> That's why we call them Franken brews. And I know just pouring it that way doesn't get rid of all of the CO2, but it certainly helps. This is actually making me kind of sad because I really love root beer. <laughs> There's going to be a couple left. <laughs> Yay. Never know, you might like the hard root beer that we end up making. And again, you might hate it. You never know. Okay, before I go too much further, can we get that spoon in there and start stirring it around, break up some of the foam? This foam should be pretty easy to break up. It is just basic CO2. We also want to stop shy of a full gallon and take a reading. So that way we know more information about this particular product before we fill it to a full gallon. I'm guessing it's probably like a 1055, like a 1.055 or so. Um, most sodas are really about that same range as like a fruit juice. I know many of you are like, what? There's no way there's that much sugar in fruit juice compared to a soda. Uh, check your labels. Yeah, health-wise, they're about the same. This just feels weird. We've made some weird stuff before, but this just feels even weirder. Need a couple more. 
Well, do you want to take a reading before, like I said, before we make it? To We're the only at 96 ounces. Okay. We're pretty far off. Okay. We can take a reading anytime you want, though. Yeah, let's take a reading. Why not? I can just pour this in. I don't need to... Avoid the foam. Oh, it'll automatically avoid the foam by pouring. See? Okay. Sort of. Kind of. Nope. Well, that didn't work at all. Let me just pour that out and try again. Aeration. <laughs> it's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, the reason why we're trying to avoid the foam, or the reason why I suggested that he avoids the foam, is because it's going to be a lot easier to take a reading if we don't have that layer of foam at the top. But I don't think we're going to be able to avoid it regardless of what method we try. I'm doing okay. That is actually kind of amazing. Um, I, I need to put more in there to make sure. It looks like it's reading somewhere around 1.040, which doesn't seem very high to me at all. It's looking like 1.044 for just the soda. That's actually a lot lower than I thought it would be. So Basically. Now we have to math. Okay. What she means by that is if we want to make this a mead, which I want to make it a mead, we're going to add honey to this. Now, I can add honey to this to get it to the gravity that I think it should be, and then we can fill the rest to a gallon because that's the way it works. One pound of honey in a gallon of must, not one pound plus a gallon, one pound mixed into a gallon already gives us 0 0.035 or specific gravity. We already have a 0 0.044, so that would add those two together, making it uh, 79, 1.079. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's not enough honey because that wouldn't be more than 50%. You're right. So I'm going to use probably one and a half pounds of honey, which would give me 35 points plus half of 35 points would be about 17 more points. So 0 0.035 plus 17 is 0 0.052 plus our 44 makes it 0 1.096. Yeah, but <laughs> the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to add in the pound and a half of honey now and then just fill the rest with root beer. Simple, right? Okay, so since I need a pound and a half of honey, we're just going to put that on the scale, everything in there, and start it up. So now it's showing zero, as in no weight at all. Now I'm going to grab some of Bevy's Bees Honey. Now this one happens to be... I think it's wildflower. This is wildflower honey. And I'm going to pour in a pound and a half of honey. Okay, really, really simple. Now I want to mix that thoroughly through did take up a little bit of volume. We went from like 96 ounces to 112. Now that 0 0.035 number is an approximate. It's actually pretty close, but every honey can be just a little bit different. I happen to know that bevy stuff is sometimes a little higher test than some honeys, so we might end up a little higher, but that's okay. As long as we're more than 50% coming from honey, we're good, which means I need to be above 1.088. Yeah, we were debating, like, uh, you know, okay, if this was a super sky-high amount of sugar, then we might only need to add a little bit of sugar to get it to a reasonable number to make a good wine, and it could have been a wine. But because we found out that it's only 0.044, it's going to be a mead. So this is one and a half pounds. 1.5 pounds wildflower honey, which is exactly 16 ounces of fluid ounces, which is shocking because three pounds is quart or 32 ounces. So, you know, I'm not really all that surprised. Honey, that is. The honey volume takes up that much space. So I just want to mix this up real good. I think it's mixed fairly well. I'm being a little sloppy with it because you want some oxygen in there. It's okay. Time for more root beer. We're at just under 112 ounces. Really, it's like literally about 112. I'm going to pour this in all so carefully. Okay, that brought us to, well, once the foam goes away, we'll really see. So that foam actually holds some of the root beer in it. It's a considerable amount too. Four or five ounces worth so far. Now those bubbles are made up of something. Because at this point we need to make a decision. It's very, very close to 128 ounces, as in it's at like 124 ounces. Do I want to open a warm root beer and only use part of it and then give her a warm root beer to drink? That I can or, easily pour it over ice. Or, ooh. Or do we want to just go with 124 ounces? Maybe we just want to go over ice. And then she can have these cold. 
Right, because now we have, we know how many bottles we use, so we have an, an amount of root beer that we added. Yes. Whereas we did a partial, we wouldn't really have an exact amount. Like in having well, that's why we use this. Sure. And actually, it's going up because all those bubbles as they're breaking are actually giving back a little bit of volume. And I'm stirring this up really, really good to degas it again because there was some CO2 in there. I know this is kind of a long process, but um, hopefully <laughs> our patients will be rewarded. All right, so how much IBC root beer did we actually end up putting in here? Four, I thought, uh, nine. Nine times, what are these, 12 ounces? Nine times 12, 108. 108 ounces. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting is as I'm degassing this, the, the foam goes up and then as the foam breaks down, it goes back in. But if I just degas, the volume goes down because the CO2 is taking up some of the volume too. Science, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, we're down to 100, 124 ounces. I'm going to call it good at that point. All right, so... We don't need this one. We don't need that one. But what we do need, I'm fairly like 100% certain, is we're going to need some yeast nutrients. Yes, we do. We're going to need some Fermado. And I don't think I have that ready yet. And then we need to choose a yeast. I already have a yeast in mind. I'll be back in a second to go over that with you. Okay, so I have here... 10 grams of ground up Fermade O. Now that's yeast nutrients. For those of you that don't know, it is our yeast nutrient of choice. It is the yeast nutrient that we use in nearly all of our brews. I am going to just mix this with a little bit of our must so that I don't add to the volume, but I still wanna make it easier for me to mix up because sometimes this stuff just clumps and it gets nasty and it's just not fun. See, it's clumping. I ground it up with the spoon and it's, it's clumping. Okay, we're well aware that 10 grams is more than the manufacturer's suggested amount. However, one of our viewers has stated that because it's Fermade O, there's really nothing in there that's bad. It's hard to overdo it. So because we don't use some of the other types of yeast nutrient, this one, we can go much higher. And he suggested something like 10 grams. We did it in another brew and it worked out pretty well. So we're gonna do it again. This needs a moment to hydrate. It's kind of getting on my nerves. If I don't, it'll never give me an accurate reading. But you know what? We can actually take a reading right now because this is the same must, so it won't change anything. Yep. So let's do that. Remember, our target was something like 1.096. However, because we only had two ounces less or four ounces less, I bet you it's going to be 1.100 right on the nose. I'm thinking that the modified cornstarch might be to for head retention. Oh. I hadn't thought of that. I don't, I don't know that for a fact, I'm just guessing. Somebody will tell me if I'm wrong. I, I, I can always count on that in the comment section. That sounded snarky, okay. but I didn't really mean it. <laughs> what I mean to say is someone usually actually knows, and if I say something incorrect, they correct me, mostly nicely. It's 1.094, so that's surprising. And this is an example of, you can never really know exactly what the gravity of honey is going to be. It is a biological product. So in this case, 1.094, but that means we have 1.050 of honey as fermentables and 1.044 of root beer, therefore mead. <laughs> Gotta get every drop. Okay, but. That's better. Yeah. Yeah. Here, I'm just gonna dump it in. See, it's goopy and gloppy. It just this is just nasty stuff to work with. Uh, and don't breathe it. I will yeah, tell you that yeah. firsthand. Don't breathe this and yeast holes both. It smells like bad feet. And you'll taste it for like an hour afterwards. I'm gonna mix this up. I do believe it's been pretty well degassed. I don't I'm not seeing a lot of carbonation happening here anymore at all. The rough pouring and the stirring seems to be working really well. So let's, um, speaking of rough pouring, guess what it's time to do? You're gonna pour it? I'm gonna pour oh, it. Oh, golly. Because why not? I want more oxygen in there, right? right? Me, there's a little bit of stir sand still left. Okay, in we could also put a funnel on that. That, I am I think I'm, I think I'm happier with that option. Okay, let me go get the funnel. All right. And you're gonna put the funnel into? The red bucket of 
because everything that we're working with has been sanitized, okay? That's very important. We didn't mention that before, but everything has been sanitized along the way. So with a funnel, really easy. I'm just going to pour it. We have found that if you tip your funnel, you, you break the seal. Break the seal. It, it's a thing. I'm well aware that I've worked really hard to get rid of all that foam and then just caused more. So okay, I'm getting some oxygen in there and we're getting more of the CO2 out. So it's all in the fermenter. Now it's time to add a yeast. For that yeast, what have we chosen? We have chosen Lowen EC1118. Did you write that down? I did. You did. And why did we choose this one? Because it's built to chew through pretty much anything. Lauvin EC1118 is what's known as a champagne yeast. They do this for the champagne method. And a basic synopsis of that is they take a finished wine, 14, 15% or so, they add this yeast to it, because it'll still have a little bit of sugars left. And then at the end, they freeze the end of it and pop out the yeast cake so that you don't get sediment in the bottom of the bottle. It's a little bit more complicated than that, I'm sure, but that's the gist. But the point is, they put this yeast in after fermentation's already done and it's 14 or 15%. That's why this is what a lot of people use when it stalls and things like that. It's also, oh, ho, ho, look at that. I did not need scissors. I think I'm supposed to, <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> oh, these tear? Is it, is it loud? One? Oh, it's Red Star. Yeah and um, Safe Ale SO4. Yeah. I have to start giving them crap too because yeah. people have been giving me a hard time yes. that I didn't give you Safe Ale Opportunity Offender. Yes. That's right. Okay. Um, but yeah, this is a strong yeast with a little bit of preservatives in there. I wanted to give it the best chance we can. So between that and the extra yeast nutrients, we should be good. And I am going to use the whole packet just because it's how we roll. I've never said that before in my life, <laughs> but I'm, I'm saying it now. And yes, I'm Back thwacking the packet, packet because there's always a couple yeast that get stuck in the bottom there and then they don't get to fulfill their destiny. I'm resisting the urge to do much to this at this point because we do have the yeast floating on top, but every time I do anything other than just a gentle shake like this, they get stuck to the sides and it just ruins it for me and I just don't like that. So instead, we're just gonna let them sit. They will hydrate and fall in, it's all good. Now it's time for an airlock and a stopper. And this one's too big, so we'll probably end up having to put a rubber band on it, but it's all good. Then we'll put the notes on it, and then what do we do? We're gonna probably put it on a tray, because we have no idea what this is gonna do. Yeah, we have no idea how happy or sad this could get. So when we say tray, it's just a small, like a cookie sheet with a lip. That way, if it gets too happy and comes out all over the place, it doesn't make a mess all over the table. And we can just, you know, keep it contained for a couple of days. If it's super, super excited, We'll add a blow-off tube. If you don't know what a blow-off tube is, it's literally just a piece of silicone tubing that would be stuffed into the stopper, comes out, goes into like a larger container, like a mason jar or something like that, filled with sanitizer, gives the gives the uh, gases a little bit larger area to come out. That's really all it's for. Makes it a little cleaner so that you don't fill this up and it shoots out because that's a bad thing. So. We're gonna let this go. It'll probably take two, maybe three weeks to ferment, and we'll be back to show you at that point what it's like. Sorry to interrupt the video, but I wanted to tell you about the City Setting VIP Club. It's a super friendly bunch of brewers who get together and constantly help each other and share information. A large part of it is our private Facebook group where you can ask questions and get help. We also have Zoom meetings monthly for most tiers of membership. These hangouts are a great way to ask questions or just hang out with us and the other members. In addition, the higher tiers get their names right in our videos. So, consider becoming a VIP. Now, back to the video. It's been about two weeks. It's time to take a reading. Yeah, the uh, airlock activity slowed down. Um, so, it's time to take a look. Doesn't mean it's done. Could mean it's done. We won't know. There's some stuff on the side of that fermenter <laughs> called croissant. It's totally fine. It's normal. I just usually try to not get it all over everything. This is starting to clear out. I got a good feeling about this. Oh, I think it's, yeah. Yep, we used EC1118 for this one. Cause I, you know, you never know. You were using a root beer, who knows what's in there. And uh, 1.000, does that mean it's done? Probably. But does that mean we're gonna rank it today? No. Definitely not. Because we have a rule, take a reading, wait a week, take another reading. If they don't change, then you rack it. Very carefully. Yep. 
We say this in all of our videos, yet the most common question I get is, so I took a reading, it was one point whatever. Should I rack it now? Okay. Take a reading. Take a second reading a week later. It's not a big deal. You're not gonna hurt anything by letting this sit a little while longer. Take it from one of our mods, Adam. He lets this stuff sit for like a year, okay? I mean, in primer, a year. He just sticks them in the back of the closet. It's like, eh. And all that happens is they get better. <laughs> That's it, that's what happens. But anyway, we took the reading. We took our notes. What's, what are we gonna do with it now? We're gonna let it sit. See you in a week. It's been another week and uh, we're just gonna do our second check on this to make sure it's really done because it was at 1.000. I'm pretty sure it's done. But it's always good to double check before you start doing anything else to it. That way you don't get nasty surprises down the road. I would say it went to like 998, but that's not enough for me to keep this going. So. It's done. We're going to rack it. All right. So we have our secondary fermenter, our full, all full of foam, straight from uh, Turbos. <laughs> can you just dump that out a little bit better? See if we can get more out of it. That's as good as we're going to get. The thing is, you don't have to worry about the foam. I just don't really like having it in there, but it's not going to hurt you. And I'm pouring this into here so that I don't disrupt all the leaves in the bottom of that. I'm but trying... he, he is doing it carefully. I'm also leaving a little bit in the bottom. It. Oh, wow, smell that. Smells like root beer. It really does. That is surprisingly good. Mm. It's very dry. I mean, it, it needs some sweetening, it needs some carbonation, it needs to be cold, but it really does taste like IBC root beer. I mean, this is also 13.5% alcohol IBC root beer right now. That's kind of nuts. Yeah. Now I'm more excited about this one. All right, if you would be so kind as to check that connection. When you're using an auto siphon, you, particularly if you switch out the tubing to uh, make sure it's clean and nice and sanitized, you always, used it for a blow off tube. You always want to make sure that your connections are good because if it comes apart while you're trying to rack, that's going to be messy and wasteful. Racking is really simple. It's just we use an auto siphon. You're taking it from point A to point B. Got to make sure that point B is lower. That's really it. I'm only going about halfway in and I left the cap on because there's a deep blanket of leaves in the bottom there that I don't want in our secondary here. We get a lot of questions on racking, like do I have to rack? Well, technically no, but here's why. In this particular case, we are hoping to probably carbonate this. If we left it like this and then racked it one day and tried to bottle, we might get more particulates in our final bottles than we really want to. By taking it off that lease, it lets us see what's really in there. It lets it drop out some more sediment for a little while, and then we can move on to the bottling process. Just makes a little more sense. Also, if you have any flavor adjustments after fermentation is complete, racking is a really good idea because otherwise when you mix all those flavor adjustments into your new made brew, you're going to also be mixing all the lease into it, creating an icky cloudy brew. That said, this is the first racking. So we want to get as much of the product out as we can. And a little bit of sediment doesn't hurt it because it's going to fall out and it's not going to get used today immediately anyway. Okay, it's racked. And as you can see, we still have a little tiny bit of headspace here. This is fine. We moved to a slightly smaller vessel. The wide mouths are a little bit smaller than the closed mouths. And we're just going to put a lid and airlock back on this. And what are we going to do now? We're going to let it sit. Well, first I'm going to put my label back is on. Is it dry? The side is. Okay. I'll just put it there. All right. And this is going to go back in the fermentation station where it's just going to have a little bit more stuff fall out. It's going to age just a tiny bit. And we're just going to make sure it's ready for the next step. So we'll see in probably a week, maybe two weeks. So it's been like two weeks. We don't need to do another reading on this. It was yeah. 998. It's done. Forget about it. Please, right. please don't ever do Brian, that again. Brian hates it when I do that. Yeah. So, of course, she does it all I the time. have to do it. Yeah, put this halfway in, do the usual few strokes, get it started. We're good. Stop, stop, stop. I heard spitting. Yeah. I do remember we tasted this last time and it was like, huh, that's not so bad. We are going to try to carbonate this. I have a new method, sort of. Not new. I have a new theory. We're going to get into it in a little while. So don't, don't go anywhere. Be back. Okay, so now that we racked it, the next thing that we need to do is sweeten it up because most likely it's not sweet enough. And we need a glass. I didn't get a glass. I'll be right back. 
I have glass. All right, so the reason why I say that is because it's at 0.998. Root beer is generally a sweet beverage, so I would expect it to need some sweetening. It's a, it's the oddest color mead I've ever made. It's it kind of looks like root beer. Yeah. It smells like root beer. Oh my god! Wow, it really does. Really needs to be sweeter. Oh boy. <laughs> No poker face. Oh, I couldn't even <laughs> hide that one. Oh. Oh, I really want to drink this now. Mmm, boy. Warm, dry. Flat. Flat root beer with alcohol in it. Mmm. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. However, it does taste like root beer. It definitely has root beer flavors, all that stayed. So it just needs some sweetening, and I think it'll, <laughs> I think it'll be fine. <laughs> as soon as Derica recovers, we'll continue. So before we did that taste, we made an executive decision, and that was what process did we want to go through from here on out? We mm. knew we wanted it to be sweet because our anticipation was we wanted it to be sweet. And we also knew that we wanted to be carbonated because flat root beer is ooh. So we wanted to avoid adding another step to that, which would be pasteurization. Because we've expressed in the past of our more recent carbonated beverages is that the perfect storm of the trifecta of alcoholic sweet carbonated beverage is basically the most complicated thing you can do in You can keg it. That's about spectrum. the best way. You right. pasteurize and keg and then, then it's all good. And we are going to do that someday. We just yes. haven't gotten to it yet. Right. So our intent for this one is to naturally carbonate it, which right. means it has to have enough fermentable sugars in it to carbonate, but not too many that it's going to explode. Right. So we decided that we were going to back sweeten this with erythritol. Yep. The reason why we chose erythritol is because we know we've been using allulose a lot as our non-fermentable sugar of choice because it's our preferred non-fermentable sugar. But we have been, through comments, pointed out that it is more expensive, which is true, and apparently it's not even available. It's not approved for use in the UK. In the UK. So erythritol, we think, is. I didn't check. I'm sorry. I know I want this sweeter, so I'm adding a bunch. For those of you curious about our method for sweetening, it's very scientific. We put enough in until it tastes good. I'm not even kidding. We're gonna add some, I just added a bunch because I know this was real, like, you saw our faces, right? It's super dry. Yeah. Root beer soda on its own, I think was something like, I didn't write it down, something in the 1.050 to 1.060 range. So we're looking for a sweetness level below that. Was it 1.044 for the soda? Yeah. I actually wrote it down. So the soda itself was 1.044, okay? So I don't necessarily want to go quite that high for the mead, but we might have to to make it taste really, really I, good. I would be okay with that. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to see what it comes out as. We go until it tastes good. That's the gist. If you're not familiar with the actual production of root beer, it's it's called root beer for a reason because made from roots. it's made from roots. roots. The the flavor enhancer is what is it now? Because it was one thing at one sarsaparilla. time, and then they changed it. Is it still sarsaparilla, or is it something know. different now? I don't. They know. change it because one of them has um like. It's bad for you. Yeah, it's got poisons and stuff. But you know, <laughs> hey, what do we need to say? So So does alcohol. Because it's it's naturally bitter. And so they add a bunch of sugar to keep that 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 flavor, but yet make it more pleasing with the additional sweetness. Now, something else about the sweetness and flavors and things like that. This is a mead. And I know it sounds sacrilegious to add a sweetener that is not honey to a mead. I totally get that. And for anyone that says that th we're making it not mead by adding al um, erythritol, you have to remember that the gravity of this was high enough that mostly honey is what was fermented. So right away, that's a mead. What you do to it after fermentation has almost no bearing on that, as long as it doesn't re-ferment. This is not gonna re-ferment, trust me. Also, technically, a mead means that 
Over 50% yeah. of the fermentable sugars are from That's honey. So. so because erythritol is not fermentable, we can put in as much as we want and it's still technically a meat. We have this lovely way of saying the exact same thing in different ways. She just said the exact same thing that I just said in a different words. I didn't hear your, yeah, I your did. preference. I said almost exactly the same thing. It's okay. He does it to me all of it. Yeah, I do. It's getting better. Mm. It doesn't taste completely like ass right now. I didn't even bleep that out. Where is the top? Another reason why when Brian said, hey, let's use erythritol to this, and I was totally like, okay, is because I knew that the strength of the root beer essence was going to negate pretty much any weirdness that the erythritol may bring to the party. Caveat to that. We did a video where we tested sugar versus erythritol versus allulose. Allulose, I chose as sugar. So that tells you how good that tastes. Tastes better than sugar. It's more sugar-like than sugar. I don't know how that's possible, but that's the thing. Erythritol had ever so slight. I mean, it was just behind allulose and sugar in flavor. It really was not, not different enough to be worthy of mention, except that I did choose allulose, which makes, in the back of my mind, me go, I have to use allulose every time. <laughs> For me, erythritol is kind of almost minty or menthol tasting. A little bit. But but it's just it's just a minute little addition. It's and this not it might like, be an, it might be a good addition. A little mint added to root beer, you know. Might be good. We'll find out. Also, these things are not as sweet as sugar, so you end up using more. Like our typical, you know, getting 46 points on a pound of sugar, you need more than a pound of this to get 46 points. But it does actually show gravity, so that's good, because gravity is really just, it's not exactly density, but it's sort of density. It's density adjacent. Somebody's gonna tell me what it really is. I forget all the time. The trick to doing this method, though, is you wanna mix it up real good before tasting it. Otherwise, you're getting a completely off reading from your taste. Yeah, that made sense, right? <laughs> it still really smells a lot like root beer. I mean, it, I think that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Cold and carbonated, I think we're 80% there, maybe 90%. A little bit more sweetness? All right, sweetness. Scotch. There's a scotch and a half. I'm not good at measuring scotches. My scotiometer was off. That's what we should do, just make up our own measurements. Yeah. And use those. We have a whole team that's ready on that. Do we? Yeah. Oh, the admins? We've been talking about that? Oh, that's right. We, we've done this before. Oh. We've had this conversation before. I wonder how angry people would be if we did that. We're just going to use our own measurements. <laughs> we'll give the conversions in the description of every video. We're going to use our own. Because people get mad that we use American units. They get mad when we use Europe. metric units. Yeah. It doesn't matter which units we use. Somebody gets offended. And the thing is, it's like language, you know? I grew up in an area that spoke English. There was no other languages spoken where I grew up, none. If I suddenly decided, which I did, to learn French, it was absolutely useless for me to speak French where I grew up. I tried, trust me, I was that kid. It didn't work out very well. Reverse, I'm a native Floridian, so being bilingual would be beneficial to me, but the language I chose to learn besides English was German, which is no help. Just as useful as me learning French in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Actually, it probably would have been better for you to learn German in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Okay, see, everybody thinks that we're so close to the Amish. I know, you're not near the Amish country. And they don't actually speak German. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a different... I mean, they might understand German. It's a, it's an amalgamation. Amalg amalg amalgamation. Thank you. That. Because they call them Pennsylvania Dutch, but they're not actually Dutch either, so... Right. <laughs> And they're three and a half hours south of where I grew up? Yeah. Not like I saw them every day. Shockingly, it's maintaining its clarity. Yeah. Usually when we do this, it gets all kinds of murky. Honey tends to be Honey worse. does it, yeah. I think... You're feeling, you're feeling it? I think we're there. Now, let me get out the calculator the teacher said I would never have. It was right here, like out of the corner of my eye the whole time I could see it. So, totally available anytime I needed it. Not only is it the calculator, it's 
It's a whole computer and the entire information of the world that is available is in the palm of my hand, not just a calculator. Anyway, using the formula original gravity minus final gravity times 135 equals ABV, we have 1.094 minus 0.998 gives us 96 points used up times 135, 12.96%. So this is like 13% root beer. Well, it's 100% root beer, 13% alcohol. Which Where makes it 87%? Where did you it's I don't know. I didn't take it this time. I have it. It was it was hiding. Okay. My pen with the flag. Uh so I'm just gonna call this 13%. Yeah. Once we or I mean it's probably a little bit lower because we added the stuff and it's fine. But we're gonna Great. actually that's true. We're gonna carbonate this. That mm -hmm. adds 0.3 to 0.4 percent. So the little bit of loss that we have from the volume difference from the erythritol probably made up for there pretty close. It's 12, 13%. I mean, here's the thing. If you hand someone a bottle of this and you say, here's, here's my alcoholic root beer. And they say, what's the percentage? And you say 12%. If they turn their nose up and say, I don't drink anything less than 13. That's fine. Don't ever offer them any again. Or you can lie and say, what ABV do you like? And they say 13. You say, there you go. If they can tell the difference, send them to me. I'd like to have them on the show. Anyway, speaking of carbonation, we have adjusted our thoughts. Okay, here's the thing. We used to carbonate a lot and it never, like we never really had a problem. 75, 85% of the time it worked and we used a basic system, okay? We've since started having some issues. So we started looking into it. What's the problem? Sometimes it's because we've waited too long. Like in this case, I'm going to have to add yeast to this or else it's not, it's probably not going to carbonate for me. Um, sometimes we didn't let it sit long enough to carbonate, which is a possibility. Other times people have said we didn't use enough sugar for priming. Now, if you know how many, how much carbonation you want, like how many levels of carbonation you want, then you can use the online calculators and figure that out. What I did is I looked at it and I said, what's the, what's the highest one? And it used like 1.8 ounces per gallon. And then the lowest one was like, um, 0.6 or 0.7 ounces per gallon. So I found something right in the middle, one ounce, 28 grams. It was super easy and simple. Well, since we're seeing that maybe that's not enough carbonation. Someone actually pointed out that it's it's not even as high as like a, a regular soda from a can. I said, okay, let me, let me up it. I don't want to go the full maximum. So instead I decided we're going to go with one and a half ounces, which just so happens to be 42 grams. Obviously that's the answer. That is perfect. That is going to be the amount of carbonation priming sugar that we now add henceforth. So if you don't get the joke, go read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> so we need some sugar. Yeah, I gotta weigh it out too. Be right back. Okay, so now that it's been racked, it's been sweetened to taste, it's time to tell you what the sweetness level actually is. Based on my memory of it, I'm going to say 1.034. I don't know why I do this. I just do it. And if anybody thinks that I edit it ahead of time and no, no. Because nope. <laughs> if I did, I would not have guessed 1.034. I would have gone with 1.042 because that's what it is. So we are two points away from what the soda was originally using erythritol. So it's going to be sweet. Okay, now we're going to prime for carbonation. And I'm going to do two things. I'm going to add some yeast because I think our yeast might be gone. We've let it sit. We've racked it a couple times. It's possible it's gone. We like to call this, well, I like to call it insurance yeast. And I'm going to be using EC1118 because this is already 13%. So any yeast that I use needs to be able to go past that and well past that. So I'm just going to take some yeast and dump it in here. Not a lot. I mean, it's like maybe a fourth of a packet. I don't want a lot. I don't want to build up a huge colony. I don't, you know, I just want it to carbonate, make some bubbles. That's all I really want. But as you can see, just, just that much, that you know, much. that's it. Okay. To that, I'm going to add 42 grams of white table sugar. Can you use corn sugar if you want to? Sure. They are a little bit different, not tremendously so. And um, yeah, that's it. And I'm going to add some of our must. 
Could you use water? Yes. If you use water, you can actually make it warm and it'll melt a little bit easier. I'm using our must because that way I'm not diluting the must at all. I'm keeping all of that 13% goodness. So that means I have to stir the bejesus out of it to get it to mix. <laughs> I could microwave this. No, you don't want to do that. Oh yeah, the yeast. The yeast. Ha! That might be bad. Now there's a reason why I'm doing it this way rather than the old teaspoon in a bottle. First, that teaspoon may or may not be the exact right amount. I don't know. I haven't actually calculated that out. Um, but even if the teaspoon is the right amount, I dare you to take 10 teaspoons and measure them for the gram weight of them. And I dare you if you can make it. Yeah, I don't I don't mean to say dare you. Like that. Yeah, you said it twice now. Uh, yeah, it sounds wrong. It, you're going to have people in the comments. And I you. don't think you could make it exactly the same every time. Consistency will set you free. And that's why we're doing this way, because we don't want to leave it up to guesswork. We want to make sure we have a uniform density of sugar to liquid ratio in all of our bottles, regardless of their volume right. size, because you want the same ratio of sugar to liquid in the different volumes. And so if you were using a bigger bottle and a smaller bottle, then you'd have to measure out different amounts of sugar because the volumes are different, right? Not just that. Can you measure a teaspoon accurately every single time? That was my point that I made I that badly with the dare part. I, I went further. I challenge you. I went beyond that. To take 10 teaspoons of sugar and measure them and have them be you exactly were, you the You've already said it. Yeah, you just need to let that go. <laughs> I can tell yeast from sugar. Okay. Yeast or white, sugar is clear. I forgot to turn the microphone up on that. Okay. And pour it in nice and careful. Okay. So now we have a lovely homogeneous liquid with sugar and erythritol. I just splashed <laughs> and it landed back in the pitcher <laughs> and yeast. So now we bottle. By the way, for those curious, no, we are not drunk. I think we had what, like this much of a taste just, for, just from this. That's it. Anyway, so now we're going to put it in bottles and we'll see you. Once that's done, if you don't know how to bottle, we have a video on bottling, but it's basically the same as racking, but you're putting it into bottles. I will link it in the description below the one, video. One other thing about bottles. We are making sure to use bottles that are made to hold carbonation. If you just grab a regular old wine bottle, it's probably going to explode. And I, I'm not even exaggerating. It's going to explode. This is meant to create pressure, which forces the CO2 into the liquid. So you want a bottle that can withstand that. We are using Aldi bottles today, I think? Nope. Nope, these are beer bottles. Beer Grolsch bottles. beer bottles. Yep. All right, so we're done bottling. If you notice, we have one clear bottle. Sorry about the burn of your hat and then the rest amber bottles. And the only reason being is we, we used to purchase amber bottles because we knew that they helped with a wide spectrum of different beverages and making sure that they don't mostly oxidize beer. and cause mostly beer, yes. But then we realized, wait. It's really hard to bottle with those. Well, I not, actually use a little light. Not only that, but you guys can't see what's in yeah. here. There could be anything there in there. There could be anything in there. There, there could be nothing in there. They could be completely empty. So we always try to have at least one clear bottle for our tasting for you. So that That's way our story and we're sticking to it. You can see, no, I actually select the bottles. <laughs> I, so I do that on purpose. <laughs> I didn't actually, I did not know that you did that on purpose. Yeah, I do that on purpose. All right. Um, so that way you can see what the heck we brewed. Today it was IBC Root Beer Mead. So these are going to go into the bomb shelter, which is basically just a tote from Lowe's. But it has a heavy nice, duty thick, plastic yeah. tote with a lid. We don't expect to have any problems because we know these bottles. We've used them a few times. They're a very, very good bottle. So if it does explode, it's because we used 42 grams of yeast and it was not the answer to everything. We didn't use 42 grams of yeast. We used 42 grams of sugar. That! <laughs> it's been one of those days, people, you know. All right, so I am going to go ahead and label these in our fancy schmancy labeling system, which is a piece of tape that I write on yep. and pack these away so that way they can carbonate. We'll be back in a few weeks once they've carbonated to give you a taste. Okie dokie, we are back. And as you can see, I have our clear bottle here to share with you so you can see what's going on. It's condensating though, because this has been chilled for like a day. And we bottled this about, well, almost exactly 20 days ago. So there you go. This has been sitting for about three weeks. It's our best chance at carbonation. So if you're ready, here we go. I'm gonna hold this close to my chest because the microphone is right here. 
Are you kidding me? Didn't carbonate. That is incredibly disappointing because we did the insurance yeast and everything. Yeah, but I had concerns about that going into this, and Brian used his Brian logic to convince me that it was going to be okay, but I, I didn't think it was going to be okay. And... We're working on alternative methods for carbonating because the natural carbonation sometimes just doesn't work, and it's kind of getting really annoying. It could be that the yeast we used as insurance yeast was one of the dead yeasts that we got. It could be. That's, that is a possibility. Um, I also believe I suggested using a high to tolerance yeast for carbonating. This is 13%. Yeah, but... I think we did use EC1118 to carbonate. Let me find our notes. Okay, so we found our notes. Ta-da! Well, Derica did. Turns out we used EC1118 to make this, but we did not notate what we used to carbonate this. I'm pretty sure it was EC1118, yeah, I think so. and it's possible that my insurance yeast concept is just completely untrue and false and doesn't work. Maybe you have to put it into each bottle. Maybe this is just, it was too far gone already. Because here's the thing, as you have alcohol in a brew, it's harder for a colony to start a fermentation, okay? So even though it's EC1118, it, it's still a little bit more difficult for it. So that's a very strong possibility. It's also a very strong possibility that the yeast that I used was one of those that we have a, a bunch oh, of yeast yeah. that are just like, they're dead, yeah. okay? We have to figure out which ones they are, so we're gonna start testing. Um, you're gonna see us um, using water to see if they bloom. Prehydration. Yeah, because we have a bunch of yeast that I think was killed by the heat. Because think about it, if it sits in a warehouse, then it sits in a truck all day long while they're making deliveries. Yeah, that yeast could be dead on arrival. So it's possible that's what we used. I'm not really making excuses. I'm trying to give every possible scenario and reason why it could be. Um, the fault's ours. It didn't carbonate. Oh well, we still have a mead. All right, it's beautiful in color. It looks like root beer. It smells it's like root beer. Smells like it root smells beer. just like root beer. See, I had concerns of doing this as a mead rather than as a wine, aka using honey as the fermenting sugar. Yeah, versus I wanted to make a mead. Sugar. Yeah, it probably just wanted, I just wanted to make a mead. He was going off the rails. That's our thing. We, we just need a, a t-shirt now. Off the rails. Anyway. There's a very mild honey uh, smell, but it's not strong. It's working well with the root beer. Yeah, we sweetened it with, with erythritol, though. Yeah, we so did. we didn't back sweeten with honey, so it doesn't have a ton of honey character. Yeah. But it seems to, the honey seems to be working really well with the root beer spices. Oh my god. I don't even care that it's not carbonated anymore. I thought this was going to be a major letdown, not being carbonated, but chilled. This is awesome. And it definitely tastes like root beer plus. It's it's more than root beer. Now, I've had hard root beer before, and I didn't like it. Yeah. This does not taste like that. No, this tastes more like a... Hard, soft root beer. Hard, <laughs> soft. Soft, hard root beer? <laughs> I don't know. It's... No, I'm getting like notes of, of caramel. Yeah, definitely. And... Caramel, vanilla. Yep. The uh, sassafras or whatever whatever it is that makes that peculiar uh, taste is definitely present. The ethanol at 13%, I'm really not detecting it. Mm -mm. There's like a, a peppery note. Yeah. But that might simply be from the root beer. Yeah. Um, Overall, this is really pleasant, yeah. really nice to drink. I don't think I would enjoy it as much unchilled at room temperature. Oh no, room temperature, I this would be, be kind of, yeah. But chilled, it's... If it was carbonated, it'd be even better. It, I'll just yeah. say that. This would absolutely. be absolutely mind-bogglingly good if it was carbonated. Because you could hand this to somebody and they wouldn't know there was alcohol in it. Mm -hmm. What it does come across, it's, it... If you think of like IBC root beer, and then you have this. This actually is more viscous in reality, but it tastes less so because I think some of the spices ferment and don't like some, it just feels like some of the body has backed off from the IBC root beer. Now, that said, this has plenty of body. It is plenty of body in this. I think for me, yeah. I'm getting more of a, a syrupy sensation, which counters what Brian just said. So, that's why I'm saying that. I think I, I think when I'm drinking root beer, 
the body that I'm getting is the the carbonation, oh, okay. really. And this, to me, is almost like liqueur-like in sensation. Particularly at the end, I'm getting a nice syrupy, and not not a gross syrupy. Right. No, I see what you're saying. But kind of like a, a root beer liqueur. <laughs> I think I'm describing it wrong. What I'm talking about is the actual flavor. The flavor of root mm. beer it feels, <clears throat> it's like at 80%. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant. And I guess that works with the viscosity to me. Mm -hmm. Um, this definitely has more viscosity than a root beer, but the flavor is lessened, so that you're, it's a little confusing. I guess what you're talking about is the sharpness in yeah. that root beer. It's definitely got less, and I think that could be from the carbonic acid, from the CO2. Yeah. Um, it also could also be from the proteins from the honey. Yeah. Um, anyway, I... But this is only uh, two, 726. July 26th, today is September... 19th, so that's, it's not even eight weeks old. This is seven weeks old. This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, because when Brian popped it and it didn't fizz, I was just like, do we even want to show this video? I was pissed. I, we were both, Brian practically didn't say the words, and if he did, they're going to be bleeped out. Um, I thought them heavily. And I was so disappointed, and I didn't think I was going to enjoy this at all. I, I'm not, I'm not, Trying to pull your chain here. No, no. We, that's the one thing I hope you guys realize. We don't lie about this. If we love something, we admit it. If we don't, we admit it. Am I really disappointed that this didn't carbonate? Yeah, but not for the reasons of unenjoyment of the beverage. I'm disappointed because I'm trying to figure out what the problem is. Yeah. That's the real reason. I think it's the bad yeast. Because we seem to have had a bunch of stalls and yeah. a bunch of non-carbonations. with. So that's... That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. We may do a test on that. Yeah, though. yeah. May have to. Um, so we need to do numbers now, right? <sighs> I'd like to just enjoy this a little bit. But yeah, we do need to do numbers. So the first number that we give, we give two scores. The first score is like a repeatability. How accessible and repeatable is this for you guys at home? I have to take off like three points for the absolute zero carbonation. I I, I would zero say you need to take off more because there's so many question marks but attributed to that. someone at home could easily carbonate this where we couldn't. Right. It, but that wouldn't be making this. That would be make it making something carbonated. Yeah, but the intent was to make it carbonated. <laughs> so are we doing repeatability on possible fictional let's not intent? Think, or? Let's not get too far into this. I'm going to say... It, they would. The intent was for this to be carbonated. So because ours didn't carbonate, I'm taking three points off right there. So it's a seven at best. Okay. Yeah. And then I'm going to take a couple points off just because it's not perfect. I mean, it's good, but it's not perfect. Did we ever... But you know what? Honestly, the fermentation went beautifully well. Oh, yeah. The fermentation went really well. It started at 1.094. It went to 1.000, then 0.998. We sweetened and added priming sugar. Okay. So can you ferment IBC root beer in this fashion? Absolutely. That part is an issue. I would, I would say it's issue. a six on the repeatability But can factor. you repeat what we actually created? I honestly don't know. Yes, they could absolutely repeat it. They just don't carbonate it. If you didn't carbonate, if you didn't prime at all, then you just made what we made. Okay. Fair. So that's a 10. That's why I'm not going there. Okay. I don't think that's, right. I, that's not what we're here for. Whatever. So I, I'm going to say it's like a six to a seven sure. for repeatability. I mean, it's you could you could easily do this, and if if you happen to get natural carbonation, or if you have some way of kegging or pressure carving, you could easily make this carbonated. It's fine. And in this case, that score is almost immaterial. Mm -hmm. Okay, it just mm -hmm. doesn't really make a lot of sense this time, but mm -hmm. it's okay. The next is just our uh, you know how do we like it? Scale of one to ten. Easy. easy. Uh, uh, I need more for science. Just drinking it. You know? It's very rich. It's really... Oh, you just stirred I, everything up. Right, I was yeah. going to pour myself some more, but not anymore. You want some of mine? I got the clean stuff. And this is one of the downfalls of natural carbonation, is you you can't help but have yep. junk in the bottom. It's, yeah, there's... there's it's, a, it's a mini fermentation. There's yeasties and stuff in the bottom that just... it never It never took for carbonation. For whatever reason. See, this is one of those conundrum meats because it's yeah. not typical. Yeah. It's but such an unusual flavor set. 
I love me some root beer. Yep. Like I have a serious root beer crush. My question is, if someone handed you this and said, what What do you think of this? Give me a score, one to 10. Not knowing anything else about it, not knowing what it was meant to be or anything like that. How do you enjoy it as it is? Because that's what this is about. As this is, not what it was meant to be, not what we think it should be. Mm -hmm. If someone didn't tell you anything and they said, drink this, give me a score, one to 10. If that's all you knew, where would you be? This is really hard. <laughs> Based on that, I have a number. If I really take it into that perspective, it changes it a little bit for me. Because my initial impression is to go low because, oh, this didn't carbonate at all. It's not what I wanted. But that's not what the enjoyment's about. It's about do we like it or not. It's got a lot of the attributes that you particularly enjoy in me. Yep. Um, it's, it's a methaglin. It's a methaglin. Te technically, because yeah. it's herbs and spices that make root beer. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And it's on the sweet side. We did sweeten this quite a bit. Yeah. To one point We may zero have actually oversweetened this. I think it's a little too it, sweet. It does feel... Oh, you know why? The priming sugar. Oh, and the then it didn't The priming sugar ferment. didn't it's ferment. So, so it's uh, actually even sweeter than what we had made. I was thinking about that. I'm like, this tastes really sweet. Yeah. I don't see us doing that. Yeah, but yeah, bad. that extra 42 grams of priming sugar makes a difference. That's a tenth of a pound. So that's like another four or five points of sugar added to it. Yeah. There you go. There you go. All right. I got a number. Are you ready? I'm ready. One, two, three, seven point five. Oh, wow. <laughs> Why are we doing this now? I don't know. Yeah. All of a sudden. <laughs> Actually, we're either like completely at opposite ends or the same. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. So I, I'll just go. I, yep. I did it at 7.5 because seven is like my mid range for good. Mm -hmm. It's not super good, but it's still good, and it's not just meh good. It's it's technically seven point five is. We're in the middle of good, and then I bumped it up to seven point five because it was better than just middle of the range good. Right. On my scale, a five is something that I would drink if I saw it on the shelf, but I wouldn't necessarily think to drink it. A ten is something that I would say I want that. A 7.5 falls squarely in the middle. There might be a day that I go, you know what? I think I want some of that root beer mead. But I wouldn't necessarily think of it most times. I enjoy this. I think it's very good. I think it's a, you can definitely drink too much of this, though. Oh, yeah. The I'm, alcohol. No, no, no. That's not what I mean. What I, that was my phone. One sec. Pockets in my shorts are not very big and my phone falls out. What I mean by that is like, it could get to be too much. Oh, because of the syrupiness? It's a little syrupy yeah. and this this is more sweet than even I yeah. prefer. Yeah. It's a little syrupy and even these this combination of spices, after a while, is a little much for me. It's just, I don't prefer it long term. Like I could probably drink this whole bottle and be okay. But more than that, I might start to go, mm, I don't know. And that's a 16 ounce bottle. I mean, it's not like, you know, a stupid, crazy amount. Sure. I wonder if you put like a little seltzer water or... Yeah, if you, if you mix this with some seltzer, it would probably be great. Um, we could, in theory, carbonate these using the, the keg thing, right. maybe. Um, I don't know. I'm not as disappointed in the carbonation as I thought I was going to be. Yeah. I thought it was going to be a deal breaker, and it turned out not to be yeah. a deal breaker, which was shocking. Now, people have asked, if you if you don't get carbonation and you have a bunch of bottles, can you like put it back into other bottles or, or that kind of thing? Yes, you absolutely can. What I'm actually considering doing is sprinkling a few pieces of known good yeast into these bottles and letting them sit for a while and see if that works. And that's a possibility because we know that the priming sugar is in them. It's definitely so in there. So there's fermentable sugars in there. Just needs a good yeast to, we just to need get it going. Yeast so it's going to do its I might thing. do that and maybe we'll either make a short or a Thursday like tasting video or something on that just showing the difference. I think a short might be the most appropriate. Yeah. By the way, if you haven't seen our shorts channel, there's not a lot of videos on there and I do make them as I get a chance to, though I've been sick for like a week, so that's why I haven't done any. And it's just City Steading Brews short. Actually, it's just City Steading Shorts, right? Yes. Yeah, City Steading Shorts is that channel. Um, go there and you'll see outtakes and various little weird things that we do. Mostly it's 
cuts from videos, but we are going to start making some new content for that too. But um, anyway, this actually came out surprisingly well. Yep. I have an issue personally with taking a soda off a shelf and trying to ferment that because there's all kinds of weird stuff in them, but this was the real cane sugar one. Yep. Someone suggested that we do Coca-Cola. And you know what? I'm not against it. I think we're going to look for sugar cane Coca-Cola. We'll do a Coca-Cola mead, wine, cider, or hydromel or something. Let's do a wine this time. I we might do a wine. I don't want to do the... And by, by that, we're just talking about the fermentable sugar yeah, differences. Yeah, that's what makes the difference. If you use honey, it's mead. If you use sugar, it's wine, basically. All right. As always, guys, thanks so much for watching, and have a great day. Bye-bye.